Good evening and good morning, everyone. We are going to wait a few seconds for all attendees to climb on board. Okay, so far only half of our attendees are on board. We are hoping that they can join in the coming moments. Okay, good morning and good evening to those of you who are joining from Japan. I'm Yurika Rikomodo, the country representative for Europe South Japan. I'm based in Tokyo and uh, I would like to introduce our guests today. Okay, so first, okay, um, you're going to have one panel with the title Planning Research to European Research Council's Funding Opportunities and our presenters are Nicolas Wale, who is Research Program Officer at the European Research Council, with her colleague Yonka Matrai, she's a Scientific Officer at the European Research Council. In the second panel, with the practical information, we are going to have two presentations. The first one, Innovative Ideas for the ERC, uh, by Toby Kears. She's University Research Chair and Professor of Mutualistic Interactions at the uh, Vrije Universiteit in Amsterdam. And our second presenter in that panel is uh, Tomo Katsura, who is a V3 Professor at the Bayerisches uh, Go Institute the University of uh, Beirut, and his presentation will be about tips for ERC advanced grant application for Japanese scientists. Okay, so I would like to give the floor to um, Nicolas and Dianka. Okay, thank you, Judith, for this nice introduction and for the opportunity. And then I will be the one who will start with the presentation and then I will give the word to Nicola. Give me please a second so that I can start to share our talk. Okay, just remove this. Uh, Do you see my presentation well? Uh, yes, it's in um, perfect full screen mode. Thank you so much. So basically, okay. um, the first presentation, okay, the general um, aim is an overview of the current and upcoming ERC grants, besides uh, the practical information that we are going to receive at a later stage. So um, I would like to thank Yanka and Nicolas again for joining us today and taking your time please proceed with your presentation. Thank you. Okay, yes. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning and good evening to everyone who joined this webinar. So together with Nicola, we will talk about our funding opportunities and we will give you some tips and tricks on how to plan your research and what to think about, what to pay attention to when you apply to our calls. And of course, in the Q&A session, we can discuss those points for which you have questions in more details. So the European Research Council is part of the Excellent Science uh, uh, Program or package, which is part of the framework program called Horizon 2020. This was a seven years long framework program running from 2014 to 2020. So it will finish this very year and it will be replaced by Horizon Europe, which is our next framework program. The, but the, the budget we had was 13 billion euros and this made up to 17% of the excellent science uh, programs only for the European Research Council. We support excellence in frontier research and we support the independence of our researchers, regardless of their age, nationality, or field of research in Europe and associated countries. And this I would like to draw your attention to. This doesn't mean that our applicants need to give up the second affiliation. We have many applicants who have double affiliation, part of uh, 
uh, day project is run in Europe, and that is the one which is supported by ERC, and they kept their position in the other uh, country, which can be anywhere else um, in the world. So we fund all uh, fields of research, and the important uh, element of these research programs is that it's investigator-driven, bottom-up research, and it has a high risk, high gain element. And we can talk about this high risk, high gain element later in more details if you are interested. We are very proud that we uh, funded up to now a total of, uh, or even more than 10,000 projects. Among our grantees, we have 82 nationalities and we have grantees in 34 EU or associated countries. Um, we have uh, publications coming out of the funded projects over the 125,000. And among our grantees, many, many prestigious prizes were won and awarded, awarded to our grantees, among which there are also the most prestigious ones, the Wolf Prize or the Nobel Prize. And another important parameter we monitor when we measure our impact is the researchers and other professionals which are hired by the teams who are funded and supported by our grants. And the number is over 75,000. So you can see that it, our impact goes beyond the very funding of the PI who applies for our grant. It's really an impact on the whole team and on, also on, on the institutional level. When we evaluate our uh, application, uh, applicants and the applications that are sent by the applicants, is really excellence. And this is the sole evaluation criterion. We measure this criterion along two main pillars. One is the excellence of the research project and the other is the excellence of the principal investigator. When we evaluate the research project, we look for the groundbreaking nature, its potential impact and the scientific approach that is described in the research project. When we evaluate the excellence of the principal investigator, then we evaluate its intellect demonstrated intellectual capacity, creativity, and commitment. So here you can see our programs to which you can apply to. There are three main uh, calls, the starting grant, the consolidator grant, and the advanced grant. These are each for, uh, run for five years. Uh, the difference is really the budget and the target group. So with the starting grant, we target young researchers who have uh, won a PhD between two and seven years um, when applying. And uh, the budget they can apply to is 1.5 million. Uh, this is the basic budget. And uh, for all the three calls, the starting, the consolidator and the advanced grant, you can apply to under certain conditions to an extra budget up to 1 million euros. In the consolidator grant, uh, we target the applicate, applicant group of uh, consolidated or more uh, middle uh, career researchers who apply within seven to 12 years after having their PhD degree or uh, some equivalent, for example, MD degrees. And uh, they can apply as basic budget to 2 million euros. And finally, the advanced grantees are our senior researchers. Here we don't look uh, the number of years after PhD, but rather we look uh, for the track record and it is, um, back to 10 years uh, from the moment of application and uh, this is uh, the grant with the highest budget and uh, they uh, can apply so our uh, more senior or advanced researchers applicants can apply to 2.5 million as basic budget also for the extra budget uh, for there are some uh, criteria for example uh, coming back to europe from um, from outside of the european or associated countries area or uh, uh, applying for a large equipment um, can be uh, asked uh, for these purposes and some others which are highlighted in the, our work program, uh, you can apply for the extra budget. Uh, the common uh, parameter uh, in these three grants is that these are all in individual principal investigator driven research projects. And so in principle, except for very, very few exceptions, uh, the applicants always apply as a single PI. For the other two, which are highlighted on the bottom of this slide, 
the proof of concept and the synergy grant. They are conceptually different. The proof of concept is a small grant and it is really aiming um, an idea that has a marketable innovation parameter or angle and um, only our ERC grant holders can apply for this. These are the grant holders, either starting consolidator or advanced grantees. And the budget is much smaller, it's 150,000 euros. And really it aims to, to start the valorization process for a marketable idea coming out from these uh, main grants. Uh, the duration of this proof of concept grant is also much uh, shorter. It's uh, one year and can be extended with a half a year. The Synergy grant is uh, the largest in terms of budget and uh, it, also the, it is also the longest one uh, in terms of the maximum uh, number of years our applicants can apply to. It's uh, six years of uh, long uh, project and uh, um, it differs from all the rest in terms of uh, the idea. It is really um, targeting groups of uh, PIs who join together in a synergistic way and uh, apply together for this grant. And uh, the number of PIs can apply uh, can be two, three or four. And the interesting uh, other parameter or feature of this grant is that um, one of the applicants, uh, so one of this group of PIs, can come and be located completely outside of Europe. So, how do we do the evaluation? When you apply to our course, you will have to choose from uh, one uh, to our 20, from our 27 panels. These panels are uh, established along uh, uh, scientific fields. For example, myself and Nicola, we are uh, uh, working in the neuroscience and neuronal disorder panel, which is in the life sciences domain. And um, to the, uh, in these 27 panels, when the incoming uh, applications are received, then they are evaluated by international peer reviewers who will be present in the panel meetings, which are our evaluate, evaluation meetings, and will be delegated also to so-called remote reviewers who will do the reviews remotely and will not join personally to these meetings. So as you can see, the 27 panels are distributed along three domains. The physical sciences and engineering having 11 panels, life sciences with nine panels, and social sciences and humanities, seven panels. When we receive the applications, first an eligibility check is run. Uh, this is really on the documents, uh, host institutional letter checking the PhD date. And then the two steps of evaluation process will kick off. So in the first step, we check the synopsis uh, or called uh, part uh, B1, uh, the CV and the track record, and uh, it is scored. So your application will be scored and these uh, scores can be A, B or C. And we really check whether they fulfill the application as well as your CV, the scientific uh, excellence uh, criterion, which I just talked about, uh, few slides ago. When you receive an A, this means that you passed into step two. A B means that your uh, application was high quality, but still not enough to pass to step two. And C really means that uh, it was of insufficient quality. Um, it has also some other consequences, whether you receive A, B and C as to whether you will pass to step two or not. If you receive a B score, it means that you can't apply for one year. And if you receive a C, it means you can't apply for two years before uh, you can apply again for a next, uh, in, in, in a next call. When your application received A and you pass to step two, your full proposal will be evaluated, which means part B1 as in step one, as well as part B2, which is the full description of your research project. And you will have an interview. At the end of this evaluation cycle, the step two, you will again be scored. But in this uh, point, you, we, can, uh, we give two uh, scores, A or B. If you receive an A, it means that your project was recommended for funding. And if you receive a B, it means that your project is not recommended to be funded. When you receive an A, it is really a recommendation and it will depend on the budget 
whether you will really see, whether you will really receive the 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 fund uh, or not. So, and most importantly, as uh, to the uh, grant, of course, which is uh, what uh, is the major outcome at the end of uh, this uh, two steps evaluation cycle, is also very important that our applicants receive uh, feedback. And it's especially important for those who were not uh, funded uh, at this time, because often we have returning grantees and we have uh, supporting data that our returning grant is based on the feedback could improve the application and were successful the second or the third time. So here I would like to um, draw your attention to certain points which uh, might be different to what uh, the community actually thinks. So we as ERC fund frontier research, but this frontier research is not only basic research. This really includes also applied and translational research. The budget is distributed uh, along uh, these uh, panels, the 27 panels, based on the number of applications that the panels have received. So it is distributed according to the demand. And this is very important because the more people apply, the more budget will be allocated to that particular panel. When you apply, you will have to, you will be asked to choose uh, uh, so-called panel descriptors. And many people in the community think that these panel descriptors represent in a way our priorities, our scientific priorities. And so we'd like to kind of guide our applicants towards these priorities. Now, this is really not true. We don't want to have any influence on your um, uh, ideas and what kind of research you would like to do. It is really just for uh, everyone involved in the evaluation process, you ourselves uh, as scientific officers, as well as our experts who will evaluate your proposal to give some kind of guiding how to uh, position in which panel uh, your proposal, but nothing beyond that. Uh, I would like to highlight that our success rate is flat across across all the calls. So starting consolidator or advanced grant at any stage uh, of the career. So whether you have your PhD only one, two years ago or seven years ago. So you are at the beginning in the middle of the end of your eligibility window, for example, for the starting grant, your chances to win is the same. It's always uh, between 12 and 13 uh, percent. And it was really this number across all the seven years of the Horizon 2020 uh, framework program. The publication record is an important element of your CV when you apply, but this is not a decisive parameter in a selection when we, we evaluate your project. We really look at the whole package and we look also for other elements like preliminary data and so on. So it's not only your publication that is uh, the most uh, decisive parameter or element of your application. And finally, the host institution is an important element of your application, of course, because you need to have a supporting document of your host institution, but not beyond that. So we don't evaluate the host institution. The reputation of the host institution is not important to us, and it is not an evaluation criterion. This table highlights the tentative dates of the upcoming calls, and we have to wait um, for uh, the, uh, the budget negotiations to end to uh, be able to fully uh, fix these dates, we will uh, keep you posted on our websites. And these are our uh, websites. So the main website is highlighted uh, on the top. It's our, uh, uh, the European Research Council website. And on this website, you can find all kinds of information about the documentations, about the, the opening of the course and how to apply, the, about the funded projects. Um, and um, you can subscribe to newsletters and news alerts. You can uh, look up contact information also uh, for the national contact points and all the additional programs about which Nicola will talk after me, especially interesting for people coming outside of the European research area. And uh, we also gave the uh, access link 
to your access, um, which is the worldwide contact points, uh, job and funding opportunities. It is also providing information on partnering and on uh, for further information and assistance you may need. And finally, we have recorded some uh, so-called ERC classes in which uh, we explain to our applicants point by point how to uh, apply to our course, what to consider before applying, how to fill the application documents part B1 and B2, how to prepare uh, for the interview, and finally a little bit of insight how the evaluation works behind, behind the closed doors. You can find these classes on our YouTube channel and you can also find further information next to our website on our LinkedIn and Twitter sites. And uh, by this, I would like to give the presentation over to my colleague, Nicola. Okay, thank you very much, Janka, for this first part. I will now um, uh, start my presentation now. I don't know if you already see anything. Yes, we do. It's not in full screen though. I am, I've clicked on it, but. <laughs> yes, it's full screen now. Perfect. Thank you so okay. much. Good. Yes, great. <laughs> So again, uh, good morning or good evening, everybody. Uh, in this second part, uh, I will stress more about the internal participation uh, um, of the ERC and how people outside Europe and outside associated countries can still uh, apply. Um, and I will uh, particularly uh, explain two uh, important elements. First, how the ERC tackles that from the ERC side. We have some incentive and a lot of flexibility in our grants to do that. And also um, some non-European countries have uh, concluded uh, special uh, specific agreements with the ERC so that uh, researchers outside Europe can also through this channel uh, participate or enter within an ERC project. So, uh, First, uh, DRC has uh, set up uh, different uh, attractive features for researchers outside Europe who would like to uh, participate in an ERC project, submit themselves an ERC project. Um, so the, the first thing that Janka uh, talked about also was this additional uh, funding that can be requested over the, uh, the general budget for a grant. And actually uh, within this additional uh, funding, it, you can ask for a startup funding uh, for scientists moving to or moving back to Europe, um, which can be quite substantial to help uh, the researchers set up the lab or buy uh, equipments that are needed and, uh, and so on. Um, then uh, also uh, when you uh, apply to an ERC grant, you need to have an institution, uh, a place where uh, you will do your research. And uh, most of these uh, institutions, along with the, 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 the country you, uh, you, will, uh, you will move to, uh, have spe specific uh, offices and specific people dedicated to help and to assist uh, applicants and grantees uh, 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 dealing with their, uh, their grant, uh, finding uh, opportunities for positions, giving even positions, uh, facilities, uh, access to, uh, um, to lab and equipment and, uh, and so on. Uh, and this is also really supported by, by the ERC. Then uh, the second part is really the flexibility of the grants. First, uh, any grantees anywhere in the world who can apply can keep the affiliation within the home institution outside Europe because it says that uh, the ERC grant uh, can be held by anybody who is at least 50% of their time in Europe but it means that you can be half in Europe and still half in your own in your home country in half of the time doing research in Europe, half of the time doing research in your former lab or, or team. Also, uh, even if the PI has to follow this rule of 50% at least, any team member within the RC team can be 
based outside Europe, meaning that they can be uh, the people already in your team or uh, in, your, in your lab in your own country. And we observe actually that almost 20% of the team members in ERC uh, research teams are actually based outside Europe. Then an important feature of the, of the ERC grant is that they are what we call portable. This portability means that grantees can move within Europe and associated countries with their grant. Let's say you uh, start doing your research coming to Germany and after a while you have a position offered in France or, or you see that the environment is not so good for your type of research and you have to move to a place where there are other facilities that are needed or equipment. You can do that taking with you all your ERC grant. So it's really a way uh, to uh, be completely independent. That's why salaries are fully eligible in ERC grants so that you have your own salary paid by the grant and you can move around if needed. And then uh, the uh, last uh, point, which is also important, is about the synergy grants that Yanka talked about. This grant uh, with two to four PIs together to make a project. And actually one of the PI can be uh, outside Europe and we have uh, uh, the case of, uh, for example, a, a Japanese researcher still doing research in Japan and part uh, of a synergy grant uh, group. So coming to Europe does not mean that you have to burn bridges from where you, you come from. You can still uh, be uh, in, uh, in the both places uh, and doing research uh, here and there without any uh, big issue. My second part will be about this arrangement uh, funding that are agreed between the RC and different countries. Um, here, the opportunity is for scientists supported by non-EU funding agencies to visit ERC research teams. This can be with a single or multiple visits from six to 12 months. Researchers continue to receive their, uh, their own home grants uh, and a stipend from their funding agency in their own country. But the ERC covers the cost for subsistence the, and the travel so that uh, these people, uh, the researcher can, uh, can move to, uh, uh, to, uh, to an ERC team. Normally, ERC uh, researchers um, um, uh, give uh, uh, the, uh, I mean, offer the opportunities to, to do that. Uh, you can have this uh, uh, through the RC website, through through uh, also the your access uh, website. So we have uh, implementation uh, arrangements with many countries. Uh, I have the list here on the side, uh, but it's, it's not it's not complete. We are every uh, every month more or less now uh, making new uh, arrangements. Uh, we have three, for example, with uh, Japan uh, since 2015, uh, one with the, uh, the Japanese Society for the Promotion of Science, another one with the Japan Science and Technology Agency, and a third one with the Japanese Agency for Medical Research and Development. So on, these, on the websites of these um, societies and agencies, you can find the opportunities if you are uh, one, uh, if you are supported by one of these agencies to be able to move uh, or visit ERC projects. So that's also a good opportunity to see how it goes, uh, how uh, research is done elsewhere, to share, to collaborate, and maybe uh, to uh, start your own uh, ERC grant. So far, uh, the internal participation to the ERC is uh, around between eight and 10% uh, of the PIs have non-EU nationalities. Uh, you can see here that are, they are um, mainly um, starting and considered uh, PIs. Um, and um, so uh, it means that almost, uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, 1000 grants are held by non-EU uh, uh, PIs. And uh, the synergy, as I said, are, uh, who start, which started um, in 2020 um, and uh, 19 and, and 20 with two goals. We have already 18 PIs out of the 75 uh, grants who uh, uh, are part of the uh, of the grant, being staying in their own in their own country. So. This is uh, more or less the end of the presentation. I hope that you have uh, got some good information and I would like to finish uh, with uh, my last slide, 
with some take home messages that can be important for you um, in order to, uh, to apply. So before applying, it's important that you understand the process and you get as much information as you can. So read the documentations through the RC website, uh, for example. Um, you can also check funded projects in your own area to see uh, what kind of uh, project have, uh, have been successful. You can discuss with the RC grantees. Uh, contact your uh, national contact points, uh, which these people are um, trained by the ERC to represent the ERC in most of the countries in the, in the world. Uh, it's important when you prepare your grant also that you check the evaluation criteria so that you give all the information that are needed by the peer reviewers to be able to fully evaluate the potentials of your project. And when you prepare your project to be original, put a clear hypothesis, put contingency plans in case it's risky. Uh, and of course, primary data may help in order to uh, give uh, some uh, good uh, elements for the reviewers to, uh, to uh, fully assess uh, um, and the, uh, the project and the risk and the potential breakthrough. And when you prepare your CV, show how competitive you are, explain what you have, uh, you have achieved so far, and avoid overselling. Uh, just be as honest as possible uh, without forgetting important elements like mentoring, like uh, uh, funding records, uh, and so on, that may be uh, good for uh, uh, your, uh, the evaluation of your CV. Then at the time of uh, the application, just prepare in advance. Uh, prepare a proposal that is review friendly, uh, not hard to read, uh, recheck uh, the, uh, the typos. Uh, you can have it also maybe uh, edited by uh, an English speaker, native English speaker. And as Yanka mentioned, you have two parts. You have uh, the CV and the synopsis of the project, which is five pages, which this will be evaluated in step one. And then the full proposal, uh, 15 pages, which will be evaluated in step two. The step one is the most uh, stringent uh, evaluation phase because it's uh, almost 20, 25% of the project, so it goes to step two. So the synopsis should really be impeccable. Everything should be there to explain uh, really um, all the elements that are necessary for the evaluators to uh, choose your project to pass to step two. When you apply, don't rush the application at the last moment. Really go through the process uh, quietly, uh, not five minutes before the deadline, because then mistakes are made and your project, uh, your application can just be ruled ineligible for just uh, uh, small mistakes that should not have happened if you would have done that on time. And in the end, if you are selected for a uh, uh, for a step two interview, just prepare well the interview and prepare for the interview. Prepare well the interview, it means that really you have to re prepare your slides, to, to rehearse, and to, of course, to prepare uh, for questions that uh, will, uh, will be asked by reviewers. Usually an interview uh, is in front of the, of the full panel, about uh, between 12 and 15 panel members. Uh, they ask, you have a 10 minute presentation most of the time, uh, followed by 15 to 20 minutes of discussion and questions by the, by the panel. So this is something that really should be prepared uh, with a lot of rehearse and maybe in front of your colleagues and others to be sure that you are doing well. So these are the, uh, the, uh, my uh, final slide. And um, now I leave the floor back to uh, Judith to introduce the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicola. Um, very informative and thank you, Yanka, um, for both of your presentations. Um, our applicants, our uh, attendees, future applicants, I should say, our attendees uh, have doubtless gained invaluable information about their future grants. And I would like to encourage our audience to submit their questions, typing them into the Q&A panel. We will read them out after all the presentations are done and uh, answer them. So please make sure that you actually type your questions even during the presentations into the panel. Thank you so much. 
I would like to give the word to uh, Toby Kears, who is a university research chair and professor of mutualistic interactions at the uh, University in Amsterdam. Uh, Toby, if you could please share your slides. Hi all, hi. So, um, welcome and uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, so I'm presenting sort of a different viewpoint, more from the um, panel viewpoint. So um, starting in 2021, I'm a panel chair at the ERC, uh, specifically on um, LS8, which is for ecology and evolution. Um, I've been a panel member at the ERC since 2018. And I'm also a panel member of the Swiss Science Foundation. So I have a sort of a broad view of how evaluation panels work. Um, I'm coming to you from Amsterdam and I myself uh, hold a, um, a, uh, an ERC starting grant that was called Markets. And I just wanna sort of give you an overview of the things that we're looking for as panel members. So I think before writing the ERC proposal, it's, it's really key to go through and sort of have a, have a checklist of the things that are mo most important in this uh, proposal process. And I think the first one, and I can't stress this enough, is what is your original and inspiring idea? And what is really innovative about this idea? Um, it's been mentioned that ERC is interested in high gain, high risk, and it's very important to be able to identify in your proposal what that means, what is high gain. Um, you also have to think about, is there any proof? Uh, do you have any preliminary data? Um, is there evidence that you've worked in this field? So again, what we want is something that's very high gain, but that, high, that you have some um, evidence that you've excelled in already. It's important to think about the impact what is the impact you know, for science, but also more, more broadly? How, does the, how is your field brought forward? How does the work that you're going to do really drive the field forward? And I like to sort of think of the question, you know, what does the world look like before you submitted this application or are funded for this application versus after you've done your research? How has the research landscape really changed? And that's what you, how you wanna convince the panel members that, that your proposal is key to changing that research landscape. And again, as it's mentioned, you know, why you? Um, I think it's important to make a very strong case for, for why you are the best person to, um, to pull off this research. Okay, so before starting the proposal, um, again, there's lots of, uh, so much information in terms of the rules of the call and understanding the criteria that you'll be evaluated on. So, Really, before you sit down, make sure that you understand all of the rules and the criteria, which I think that ERC has done a wonderful job of putting that in a very easy to understand way. Do you know the rules and do you understand the criteria? Okay, so as it's been mentioned, um, there's, there's two real main parts of the proposal, uh, B1 and B2. And so I'm briefly just gonna go over what those would look like, starting with B1, which is also known as the synopsis. Now, the synopsis is, Again, as Nicolas said, it needs to be impeccable. I think that's a fantastic word for describing B1. And what B1 allows you to do is it allows you to describe your dream project. It allows you to describe this dream project and, and summarize it in a very tight and concise way. And what's I think really key um, in understanding how to write this first synopsis is that it's going to be evaluated by the panel. And the panel is, is, is very broad. So it's not going to be necessarily specialists in your field. So it needs to be broad and it needs to be convincing to people outside your particular field. And again, at this point, there's, there's going to be lots of proposals coming in and the panel, which is broad, is going to have to evaluate those. So you have to, you have to really think hard about how to make yours stand out. What is it about your work that's going to stand out among all of those different proposals? And again, what we're looking for is in, it's got to be inspiring and we want claims that, that, you know, this is the research of the future, but it's got to be substantiated. And I think the use of figures and schematics, um, people even say, you know, 30 to 50% of that, of that first synopsis can, you know, contain figures and, and, and schematics. It really gives us us as a broad panel, a nice overview. Um, 
And I think this is key again for, for, for catching the attention of the panel is using figures and schematics that really summarize what you want to do and summarize perhaps some of the preliminary data that you're going to present in more depth in B2. Um, so figures and schematics are important. Um, it's also important in, in the um, B1 that you, 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 know, you describe your approach. And I think we see a lot of proposals that introduce novel techniques. And I think everybody on the panel is usually pretty excited about these novel techniques and allowing scientists the breadth to be able to de develop this kind of approaches. Now in, in B1, it's also important again to stress you as the PI and, and you making it possible. Um, now, of course, people always say this is very challenging, right? To try to fit something in such a small uh, scale, you know, five pages, it's, it's, it's very challenging. And that's why it takes a lot of time. But the tighter it is and the more compact, really the more compelling it is. And, and it's really your opportunity to, to describe your dream project in a very succinct way. Okay, so the main points is that you need to, to express to us as the panel members that this is a brilliant idea and it can be accomplished, right? You need both of those, the feasibility and the creativity. Um, and, and that's important in section A, especially where you set the scene. And it's because the panel is so broad, we really want to know where you position yourself in the field. For example, you can say, we know X, but we don't know Y, and I'm going to bridge this gap by so that's sort of a key sentence is so that we know where we are, where you are in your field, the, the open questions and how your research specifically is going to drive the field forward. Um, really stressing the novelty and the significance, um, the research questions, how the main objectives are connected. Um, again, the approach and, and what is novel, are you trying something different? Um, and then a real feasibility, a really close and honest look at the feasibility of your research, looking at the work packages, the timeline. And I think it's really important, again, to include a risk analysis. Um, the ERC is looking for high gain, high risk research, but they want to know that you have successfully identified that risk and have ways of contingency plans, for example. Um, and you know, to summarize this section, I think it's really important to, to sort of understand, yeah, what are the expectations? What are we going to get out of it? Um, because we're reading so many of these proposals, we really want a succinct way of understanding what, what are the achievements of this work and why are you the one to achieve it? Okay, so again, just a, a simple checklist for, for that B1 is original idea, very, very um, uh, succinct and clear proposal that you can substantiate your claims, um, that you explain your approach and your novel methods, you know, that there's this nice balance between published and preliminary work. Um, collaborators, again, especially in the starting grants, we see people bring in lots of collaborators and that's, that's good, right? That shows that you, you're, you're using um, the scientific network and that there's a lot of interdisciplinary science going on. The collaborators are there for support and not to lead. And that's very important. So, so it's nice to have uh, collaborators and, and clarify um, how they're there to support the project, but not to lead the project. Um, and really, you know, I think again, it's, it's very important to make the, the, the text as tight as possible um, and clear for a non-specialist. One of the take home messages again, is that you're really aiming for excellent science, the best science. The aim is not to save the world and everything else, but to really present honest and best excellent science. Okay, there's also other sections of B1 that are very important in the evaluation process. Um, and that's the CV, which is quite standard. That's basically describing who you are. And then I would say um, also, the, sorry, that's supposed to say section C. Um, now, this is really important. This is a two page maximum, but it's really giving you a track record of, of what you've done. And this track record differs, obviously, if you're in the starting versus consolidated versus advanced. But what it does is it allows you to place yourself and your work in this broader context. Um, here we talk about awards and international speaking engagements and outreaches. Um, 
you know, what makes you, what makes your work outstanding and original and how is your leadership and, comp and, and competence uh, demonstrated? So that's really your area to shine as a, P, as a PI. Okay, now to, to finish up, so section B2 again is, this is the point where your proposal will be sent out to specialists, right? So this point, you have much more space and this is where you're going to get feedback from specialists in your field. So again, you want to have the same story, but you must be aware that your audience is going to be slightly more knowledgeable and more critical. And this is really aimed at the specialists. So again, we're going to talk about the, you know, the state of the art and the objectives. But here you really want to delve more into the current limitations of the field and how your approaches and concepts and ideas are going to drive that field forward. And again, this will be read by specialists. So you want to make sure that their ideas um, and the past work, the, the, the shoulders of the scientists that you're building on is appreciated and, and mentioned and put in the references. Now the references for this section have to be very, very carefully chosen. They need to be com competent and balanced and fair because it's really going to be read by those people in this field. Um, Again, here is where you can go into more interdisciplinarity between fields, uh, your main objectives, um, and again, figures and overviews and schematics. You have even more space for those types of visual um, um, additions, B2. Now again, because this is going to specialists in your field, but you're trying to drive the field forward, you really need to be very respectful in this section um, and make it clear how others have advanced uh, science to this level, but now how you as a emerging scientist, if you're in starting or, or, or any level, how you're going to take it further. Um, so those are, I think the, the sort of the most sort of the tone of this section is very important. Um, and again, the methodology. Yes, this is where you have a chance to really clearly and precisely lay out your methodologies. More specifics, more risk analysis um, becomes even more important. So this is your chance to say what you can actually achieve. Okay, again, here's the checklist for B2, where it's going to be sent out to the specialists. Um, really, you know, when we're trying to read all these and summarize what we find, we are, we are asking what's the high risk, high gain part of this proposal? Um, what is the gain? Can you clarify that? What is new? What is original? Um, are you bringing together new concepts? Are you bringing together new fields? Are you developing new approaches? Again, this question of originality, I think, is, is, is very important for, for excellent science. Um, you can mention here the, the practical outcomes. And of course, that shouldn't be the only focus. Um, for example, patents and things like that. It's not the only focus, but it's always nice to hear practical outcomes as well. The most important thing I think I can say is that once you've completed all the parts, get feedback, then get more feedback, then get more feedback. Really, I think it's a process. These proposals are, 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 are large and they, um, they really require a level of precision that I think comes from very, very um, high levels of revision. So again and again, having people read it and trying to incorporate that, that feedback. I think this is my last slide. Um, I just want to say that really the, I think the important take home message is that this is your chance to write your dream project. Um, this is your chance to have creativity, rigor, and show your independence to the scientists. And I think the, the sort of the most common mistakes that we see as panel members is really a lack of clarity. Because we're reading so many of these proposals, we want to almost have it given to us on a plate. We really want to understand why this is important, why you're doing it, what approaches you're using. Um, so again, clarity is, is key here. It's also important for us to understand why you think this work is important, right? It's not necessarily our job to know your field and know why this specific question is important. So, so make that very clear. Why is this work important? Uh, another common mistake, I think, is that there's no clear link to, to the bigger picture. We're interested in the bigger picture. We're interested in supporting science at a very high level. So, so make that clear as well. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Toby. Uh, that was absolutely, well, what can I say? Uh, if I were a grantee, um, you know, who's actually uh, planning to write an application, I would definitely uh, go by your advice. Thank you so much. I'd like to invite Tomo Katsura. He's a V3 professor at the Bayerisches Sego Institute in the University of Beirut. And I'm not sure if you can hear me. Yes. Yes. Again, I to can. our attendees, yes, to our attendees, just uh, one tiny word. If you could please type your questions in the Q&A. Uh, we will still have uh, some time to answer your questions. So please type your queries in the Q&A panel. Uh, Tomo, if you could please share your slides. Okay, um, he's going to talk about advanced grant application for Japanese scientists, but I'm sure that the information will also be useful for international applicants, future in international applicants. So thank you very much again for coming. And yes, you're in full screen, perfect. Thank you very much, Judith. So I'm Tomo Kasra from Bayerische Skill Institute, University of Bayreuth, Germany. Uh, so uh, first, let me introduce myself. I'm working in solid earth science. More detail, uh, high pressure mineralogy and study of the earth and planetary interiors. More concretely, I determine physical and chemical properties of minerals that may be uh, present in the earth and planetary interiors by means of high pressure and high temperature experiments to obtain better understanding about the structure, dynamics, and evolution of the earth and planetary interiors. So uh, this is my CV. Uh, I obtained a PhD at Okayama University, Japan, 1991. Then I was uh, employed as a postdoc in University of Bayreuth, and uh, I was employed by uh, Okayama University, 1993, as an assistant professor. I was then uh, promoted to associate and floor professor at the uh, Institute for Study of the Earth's Interior, ISEI. Um, in 2010, I moved to Bayerische Scale Institute, BGI University of Bayreuth, Germany, as a, a full professor. When I moved to uh, Germany, I was already 47 years old. Therefore, it is something uh, like a new tricks for an old dog. Uh, I also jointly affiliated uh, in a center for High pressure, science, high pressure Science and Technology Advanced Research China from 2018 as a research scientist. This is joint affiliation. So uh, many people ask, ask me why I moved to Germany. Therefore, uh, please let me explain shortly. There are three background factors. First is a uh, the ISEI was located in a remote place. It, is, it was located in uh, Misasa town, Totori prefecture. Uh, many Japanese can imagine how, uh, what a remote uh, place it is. Secondly, uh, Okayama University is not a highly respected university in Japan. Therefore, I had many inconveniences there. The third, which is the most important, the researcher's life in Japan is too busy. So uh, the scientific, scientific reasons of my movement are as follows. Firstly, uh, I can have a good uh, technical assistance in the PGI. And in Germany, we can employ postdocs more easily than in Japan. Uh, it is not uh, easy to employ postdocs uh, in, in Japan uh, using uh, research grants. And uh, we can have uh, more possibility of a uh, collaboration with researchers from related fields. Uh, in my opinion, uh, Japanese are not good at uh, collaboration uh, with the researchers from uh, related fields. I have uh, another reason, uh, which is uh, rather personal. Uh, 
I have a, a children. Uh, I have children uh, who plays uh, music instruments very well. Uh, my son plays cello and my daughter plays the violin. And my wife and uh, me wanted uh, to have a good music education to our children. And uh, the, in, in Germany, uh, we can have a, a very good and, uh, music uh, education with a very cheap price. Uh, in comparison with a uh, uh, remote place in Japan. So uh, it was already explained, but uh, let me shortly uh, explain the uh, ERC advanced grant which I obtained. This is the almost largest grant research grant in Europe. And uh, this is basically for senior scientists. The de degree of difficulty of a ERC advanced grant is probably uh, between uh, granting aid for specially promoted research, Tokobetsu uh, Ishin Kenkyu in Japanese, and uh, granting aid for uh, scientific uh, research, Kiban Kenkyu uh, S in Japanese. Uh, so uh, the I have no experience with uh, specially promoted research, but Tokubetsu uh, Shinkenkyu, but uh, I have uh, uh, one successful uh, experience in the Kiban Kenkyu S. Therefore, this uh, agrees to my uh, assessment. The uh, amounts also uh, agrees to my assessment because the direct cost of the Tokubetsu Shinkenkyu is two to four uh, million euro, and the direct cost of the uh, scientific research S is uh, 1.5 million euro. So, uh, the let me talk about values of uh, ERC advanced grant. The uh, most obvious reason is that uh, we can have a large research budget, especially we can have a large consumable budget, which is especially important for uh, high pressure scientists because the uh, uh, consumable cost of the high pressure science is extremely high. Unfortunately, it is not easy to obtain large consumable budget by the grants supplied by German Research Foundation, DFG. The second uh, reason is, uh, uh, the second value is we, uh, we can tackle challenging and ambitious research. Uh, the concept of the uh, ERC grant is a high risk, high gain. Uh, for example, uh, in my experience, the concept of uh, D DFG uh, evaluation seems low risk, but a solid return. Therefore, uh, uh, if we write a too ambitious and a too challenging research project, then uh, it is not easy to win, uh, obtain uh, support by the DFG. And uh, uh, the threat is that uh, we can obtain high status as a scientist. In it. The uh, ERC uh, grant winners are highly, highly respected in Europe. Sometimes uh, uh, Japanese scientists in uh, Europe feel as if uh, they are uh, demoted uh, but uh, if you win uh, ERC research grant, we are highly uh, uh, respected and uh, we can have a very high status as a scientist in Europe. So uh, this is, uh, slide summarizes my ERC advanced grant. The title of my uh, uh, Project is chemistry and transport properties of Bridgmanite controlling lower amount dynamics. Uh, this uh, project aims to determine properties of the major lower amount mineral Bridgmanite by means of advanced high pressure, high temperature experimental technology. I submitted this proposal to the category PE10, Earth System Science. I submitted uh, this proposal in August 2017, and it was approved in uh, April 2018. The total amounts is uh, uh, 2.6 million euro. 
uh, among them uh, are 0.86 million euro uh, is uh, for postdoc employment and the second uh, and the one point uh, one million euro are uh, for uh, consumables and uh, the uh, proportion of the equipment is very small it's uh, only 0 0.05 million euro the peer load of uh, this project is uh, from october 2018 to september 2023 so uh the uh, following the possible uh, desired uh, scientific conditions for the success in ERC adv advanced grant, in my personal opinion. Firstly, the uh, scope of the topic must be wide. The panel uh, PE 10 covers almost all fields of earth science, including uh, geology, uh, paleontology, environmental change, oceanography, uh, climatology, and so on. And the topic should interest the panel, panels from other fields in earth science. Therefore, only deep knowledge in the own research field is insufficient. Certainly, uh, this is the case for other uh, categories, uh, other panels in the ERC uh, grants. And also, this is the case in the uh, Japanese grants of uh, Tokubetsui Shinkenki or Kiban Kenki West. Another important uh, point is we should have a distinguished feature from uh, many other studies. In my case, uh, other workers use a uh, diamond ampule cell uh, for high pressure temperature experiments to uh, investigate the Earth's lower mantle because it, it can generate very high pressure and temperature conditions. But the results obtained uh, by uh, using this uh, instrument is rather unreliable due to the, it's a small sample chamber and in homogeneous temperature and uh, pressure fields in the sample. My strategy is a, a use of a large volume press uh, this apparatus can uh, bring uh, can uh, allows us obtaining uh, very reliable results, but the uh, pressure and temperature conditions that can be generated using this apparatus is much uh, more limited compared to diamond ampule cell. Uh, we nevertheless uh, expanded the peak pressure range. Uh, that can be generated using this apparatus twice more and to allow uh, studying the uh, lower mantle by a high pressure experimental technique uh, uh, using a, a large volume press. So uh, then uh, the following is my strategy of a proposal preparation. So as I already discussed, the uh, width of the research topic is uh, very important. Therefore, uh, we should define a wide scope research topic to attract many panel members. The secondary, uh, se second, the for, uh, we should uh, form a team. The budget amounts uh, seems to be considered too large for one scientist and uh, a variety of uh, collaborators could cover a wide scope. Uh, the second important point is that the contents of the proposal should be uh, easily uh, understood by uh, many panel members. Therefore, uh, text, should be, text of the proposal should be written very plainly, not too specialized and not too detailed. Uh, it is also important to uh, have uh, suggestions, criticisms, and criticism, uh, questions by many other uh, people, not only scientists, but uh, uh, administrators before submission, in order to avoid uh, unexpected criticism by uh, reviewers and others. Then uh, I emphasize the importance of uh, uh, two pages CV and uh, 
in two pages a uh, uh, 10 years track record, which, the, which must be extremely attractive. Uh, appeals in these parts are very important for success. Uh, this is uh, very different from a uh, uh, brand in Japan. Many Japanese do not care about uh, their, uh, how to say, for example, uh, awards and so on. Uh, you, uh, make, you know that uh, in Japanese grants of uh, proposal, there is no uh, pages of the CV. So uh, what we can write is uh, the current position only. We have uh, no space to write the uh, award and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, we should demonstrate how uh, you are uh, respected in your research field. Therefore, we should collect uh, uh, prize, awards, fellowship. Uh, we should uh, give a pre uh, invited presentations, organizations, uh, international meetings, promotion of uh, young scientists, institutional leadership, teaching, and editorships. We should uh, uh, emphasize and clearly show these uh, uh, points. In contrast to the Japanese uh, grants, we can uh, uh, write only 10 publications in the last 10 years. Therefore, uh, the number of uh, publications is not important at all. Probably uh, we should uh, publish uh, our papers in the nature or science or nature sister journals, science and versus uh, advanced or penis or uh, Q4 journals uh, defined by uh, in journal impact factors. And uh, uh, finally, uh, and, uh, another important point is uh, we should have a good friends uh, to support you. Uh, human relations are also important in Europe as well as in Japan. So uh, let me uh, explain the process of uh, a proposal preparation in my case. So uh, this slide summarizes uh, my uh, activity for one to two years before the uh, submission. I started to prepare uh, pro uh, preparation, uh, started the preparation of the uh, proposal two years before the submission. I read the reference papers as wide field as possible to understand hot topics in fields surrounding my own research field to have a wide scope in research. My major is mineral physics and my surrounding fields are seismology, geodynamics, geoelectromagnetism, geochemistry, pathology, and geology. And as Therefore, I read uh, uh, many papers in these fields. And uh, I asked uh, some friends to nominate me for some awards and uh, fellowship. Because uh, before considering the submission of the ERC grant, I have never considered to have uh, uh, such uh, honors. Uh, fortunately, uh, I obtained uh, one award and uh, I was elected as a fellow in one uh, scientific society before the submission. I also, uh, I asked uh, my Japanese friends of the ERC grant winners about uh, their experiences and uh, uh, clarified the difference from a Japanese grant. Uh, this slide summarizes uh, my uh, activity uh, between uh, one year and a half years before the submission. I started to write a draft of the proposal nine months before the submission. I asked uh, two colleagues that previously won ERC grants to let me uh, read their successful proposals. Uh, I read more references to expand my background and confirm my knowledge. And uh, I informed my plan of uh, ERC grant proposal submission to the university's administration to support the grant application. 
I let uh, my postdocs uh, uh, read the, my proposal draft to give me some comments. Uh, after collecting my, these information, I, have re I, I realized my research topic that constant was uh, insufficient. Uh, I mean, the, too narrow for satisfy the panels of the ERC uh, grant. Therefore, I expanded the research topic. For this uh, reason, I asked some uh, institute colleagues to join uh, this pro project as a co-investigators and asking them to read the draft and uh, provide me uh, comments. And discussed, I discussed with the university administrators about the budget structure. I asked uh, renowned Japanese scientists in related fields to give me a comment on the proposal. Unfortunately, I uh, do not have uh, so many uh, European friends in the other field or related field of, out of the mineral physics. Therefore, I asked uh, Japanese scientists in the uh, uh, surrounding fields. This is, of course, for examining whether my proposal is attractive for researchers in related fields or not. So uh, let me uh, emphasize the merit of working in Europe for Japan scientists. The most uh, important uh, merit is we can have much more time for research in Europe. Uh, of course, the time is the most important for a resource for research. Nevertheless, the Japanese researchers' life is too busy. Um, when I ask, uh, by, um, I feel uh, as if I were on sabbatical every day after I moved to uh, Germany. This is because uh, I have uh, less administrative works and uh, more uh, support by secretaries and uh, technicians in the Bayerisches Institute. And uh, working with postdocs uh, tremendously increases research budget with uh, uh, my uh, limited working time. And I also realized that uh, I became better at uh, managing English, the, which I did not expect before moving to Germany. As you know, Japanese have to forget Japanese language when managing European language, because the Japanese and European language are so different. And we have to make a switch to change our brain from a Japanese mode to English mode to uh, manage English very well. If you live in uh, European countries, we can make uh, uh, such a switch. So uh, as a result, uh, the speed of uh, reading and uh, writing papers increased tremendously. Unfortunately, speaking and uh, uh, listening uh, needs a uh, uh, talent, therefore it was not so much improved. Finally, uh, I would like to emphasize necessary conditions for success in Europe. First is a support by the spouse if you married. Uh, this is needless to say and, uh, uh, yeah. and uh, uh, again, uh, secondly, again, the support by good European friends is uh, very important. I would say uh, no Japan scientists can succeed in Europe without support by uh, European scientists. And that's uh, last uh, but not least, uh, we should uh, forget the Japanese modest uh, Kenjo no Bitoku in Japan, Japanese. Uh, Japanese modesty uh, often degrades the social status of Japan scientists in Europe. Uh, we should appeal our excellence as a scientist more explicitly, which is uh, 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 Japan scientists are very uh, poor at uh, these, uh, 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 these uh, uh, appeal. Without appealing, uh, no uh, Europeans know that you are an excellent scientist. 
And uh, if I exaggerate, this is exaggeration, but uh, uh, we can be friends with a European scientists, especially excellent European scientists, only if we are recognized as uh, excellent scientists. So uh, this is uh, 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 my, uh, what I want to uh, emphasize most strongly in my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. That's uh, today's my talk. Thank you so much, Tomo. That was very informative, especially where you emphasized um, how Japanese scientists can be recognized in Europe and how um, you recommend them to try to fit into European society in any given country. Uh, especially the step-by-step -step explanation of how uh, you recommend uh, future applicants to proceed with the paperwork was very, very useful. Very much. We do not have um, a lot of time, but I believe we still uh, can go a bit over time. And uh, there is one question streaming in, okay. Does the ERC have grants, fellowships, to support the recent PhD students? Uh, for example, one year from graduation. Um, who would like to answer that question? Maybe I can start. Thank you so much, Yanka. So one year is uh, uh, just too short because the starting grant is uh, from two to seven years, counted uh, from uh, getting the PhD. Um, nevertheless, of course, uh, visiting uh, programs are possible, uh, what uh, was explained by Nicola. And uh, that is what I am aware of uh, considering ERC, but there are many other opportunities con uh, considering other funding agencies, funding bodies in Europe. I don't know, Nicola, if you would like to add anything to this. Yes, I'm sorry, my, my background has turned, I don't know how <laughs> such ugly, but uh, so normally, yes, we, uh, the, the window to start with the ERC grant is, uh, is two years after the PhD. Uh, so before that, usually it's the Marie Curie uh, fellowships that uh, uh, can be asked at the, at the EU level. So you may ask, uh, about the Marie Curie uh, uh, granting uh, possibilities. Thank you so much. And the second question, is it possible to set a budget for measurements in a lab outside the EU? Also to plan budget to be spent outside Europe for taking samples, for example, rock samples. Thanks a lot. Yes, sure. I mean, uh, uh, we have a lot of PIs uh, requesting uh, uh, money for uh, for missions uh, or put to go abroad to get samples, to make interviews with uh, uh, with people when the project needs that, to uh, to go to uh, to meetings, conferences all over the world. So yes, the, all these costs are eligible within the ERC grant. Thank you so much, and. Uh... Yet another question has arrived. Okay, let me uh, try to rephrase it. Um, can only postdocs have a starting grant? So are starting grants only for postdocs? No, um, that can be for anybody who fits within go. this window. I mean, uh, we have uh, yes. study grantee who are quite old because they did a, uh, an MD long time ago and then a PhD uh, later, and then they can apply for a starting grant. So it's really uh, what yes, counts this eligibility window between two and seven years. And then there are extensions also uh, of this window of two to seven years in case of uh, illness, maternity, maternity or paternity leaves, uh, uh, um, uh, special specification, uh, spe specialization, uh, sorry, uh, when you are an MD. So th there are uh, ways to, to go over. Yanka, you, you want uh, to May I just add to, exactly, because I think I understand the question in a different way. 
uh, in my reading, it, it would uh, say that can uh, starting grantee have only postdocs in the application? This is how I understand the question. Um, and my answer is yes, of course. The only thing is to, you, you compose your team the way how you want. Uh, there are no um, restrictive uh, guidelines to, on that. Uh, at the same time, of course, as your career develops and goes further um, in your CV in the next stage of, of uh, applications and, and um, next stage of your career, it will be seen whether you had uh, PhD students when you're, you participated in the um, development of your team, education, etc. So these are points you all have to keep in mind. Yeah, thank you for the clarification. Um, okay. And yes, um, the attendee says, yes, that's my question. Many thanks for clarifying. Yes, thank you very much. Any further questions? Okay. okay. Uh, does the panel consider employment history? For example, the difference, difference between an applicant with one postdoc versus three postdocs. No, no, no. Normally, I mean, uh, the, this is not a criterion of evaluation. So, <laughs> I means uh, so some applicants have uh, done their uh, PhD and postdoc within the same university and uh, uh, without any mobility, and it's not a criterion of, of evaluation. So, the past records uh, is not looked uh, scrutinized uh, in details to what kind of positions the PI had and so on and so forth. The 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 uh, the idea of uh, I mean the evaluation of the of the CV is really to check that the PI has the capacity the expertise to uh, to do this project. That's that's all that counts. Thank you so much. Any further questions? Yes. Okay. For someone who is working in Japan, what will be the process for getting approvals from host institutions? Uh, this, I don't understand the question. If the, for a host institution, your own host institution in Japan or the institution in Europe where you would like to go to? Which host institution are they talking about? <laughs> European institutions. They can clarify. Yes. <laughs> they can clarify. That will be helpful. Yeah, the question is. But okay, let, let, let's answer both both questions, and then uh, uh, that would be okay. So, uh, I mean, for your host institution in in Japan, if you would like to keep your affiliation, this is really a negotiation between you and your institution. If you have a full position, a tenure position, if you have a grant from one of the of the big uh, Japanese agencies then it's up to you to keep this running while you are in Europe. And on the other side, if the question is that uh, talking about the host institution in Europe, then it's um, the, the uh, what we request at the time of the submission of the application is that the host institution just send a letter. Uh, we have a template that is provided guaranteeing that they will welcome the PI uh, and give some lab space to do the, the research. That's it. So, or the PI contacts in advance the institution with which they already collaborate, uh, or they search for the institution that would be interested. There are many um, possibilities and uh, advertisements uh, in, in many uh, journals, uh, websites, uh, including uh, your access, uh, uh, offering positions here and there. So, I mean, there, there are many possibilities for them to find a institution in Europe uh, if they want to, uh, uh, to try uh, to go for an ERC grant. I, I hope I've answered the question, but. <laughs> yeah, I'm checking, I guess so. Okay. And another question, not having a student supervision in the CV, is that seen by the panel as a big disadvantage for starting grant applicant? No, I mean, uh, the, uh, uh, the mentoring activity is looked, part, is looked for the advanced grants applicants. So for starting grants, you may just be uh, a postdoc on your own uh, applying. There is no, uh, 
no mandatory uh, mentoring activity or supervising activity. But of course, if there is, it's, uh, it gives some guarantees that the PI is able to manage a team, but it's not at all compulsory and it's not a criterion of evaluation. Okay, and we have time for one more question. And then I'm afraid we'll have to say goodbye to all our attendees. I would like to encourage you to uh, follow us on YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and also the portal. You may send questions or basically any sort of queries asking for advice at japan at eurocess.net. Uh, any further questions? No, okay. So again, please send your queries to japan at eurocess.net. I will try to relate them to our colleagues at the ERC or uh, even Tomo in Germany. Thank you very much for coming. And a very special thanks to Janka, Nicola and Tomo for uh, presenting about this very useful and invaluable topic to our attendees. I'm looking forward to seeing you in our future webinars and thank you very much for contributing to the event. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye.